Hi, everyone. I'm Chris Aldana, and this is the National Education Policy Center's Education Interview of the Month. This month, we're speaking with Wajma Mamandi and Kevin Wellner, the authors of the new book, School's Choice, How Charter Schools Control Access and Shape Enrollment. Wajma is a PhD candidate in education policy at the University of Colorado Boulder School of Education. She's also a former public school teacher. Kevin Wellner is a professor and the director of the National Education Policy Center, which is housed at the CU Boulder School of Education. Thank you both for being on this month's podcast. So Kevin, let me start with you. In your study of school choice, why did you decide to focus on access as opposed to other more common charter school issues like achievement or segregation? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I think for us, the issue of access is the cornerstone of all those other issues, that we can't understand issues like uh, achievement or like segregation or like innovation or even the the basic publicness of charter schools um, if we don't probe and understand the issue of access. So Wajma, let me ask you, how did you study access? So to to document how charter schools shape access, we combined expert interviews with a review of the literature and a review of media coverage and, and key documents. And um, we realized that randomly sampling charter school leaders and asking them about the ways they shape access would not be productive. So instead we turned to sources that could give us a peek behind <clears throat> that curtain and did what researchers refer to as purposeful sampling. So ultimately we interviewed 40 people. We looked at over 200 news articles, 68 published reports and um, 59 school authored documents. And we took a, kind of comprehensive look at the existing peer-reviewed literature on charter schools that included anything related to access. Um, so this data set had strengths and limitations. We are not quantifying um, anything or determining how many charter schools use a given approach. Uh, we don't make those claims, but our data does allow us to provide a really rich picture of how access issues are playing out um, around the country. So, so I want to go back to the factors that create the inequity and inaccessibility you describe in your book. So the school choice logic implies that within a market, uh, schools adapt to the preferences of students and families. So that allows them, at least in logic, um, to thrive. So why, in your, your view, has this not played out? Or in other words, what sort of incentives are driving charter school operators uh, that result in the exclusion of some students? Well, I think the word incentives is the right one there. Um... Charter schools exist in a context, right? So a charter school wants to be able to thrive. A charter school, um, operators of a charter school are looking to um, do well that year and build a foundation to do well in future years. And doing well in this in the current context means not just enrolling students, which is certainly important, but, in, but enrolling the right students. And the right students are determined by those incentives. Um, so you want, if you're a charter school operator and you want to do well in the current context, you need to enroll students who are um, who have rich opportunities to learn outside of school so that they come in with high test scores and are going to continue to have high test scores. You want students who are coming in without a lot of expensive special needs. So you might want to screen out students who have moderate to severe disabilities. Um, and you might want to screen out students who are coming in um, burdened by racialized poverty in the U.S. You might want to exclude students who are um, not yet fluent in English um, and might drag down your test scores because those tests are generally offered in English and might require additional uh, support staff. So all of those things um, control the, uh, the incentives that, that schools operate within. The rules matter, essentially. When a, when a when a state law is put in place, the specific provisions of that state law that create the possibility to, to open charter schools, they differ from state to state. And those differences matter. And the changes that we could, that we could make after doing a study like this, the, the recommendations that, that we could offer, would allow a state to change those incentives, right? And change those rules that's, that the charter school operators are, uh, are working within. That doesn't mean that there aren't some charter school operators who buck the incentives, who can be the, the exceptional schools. But until we change the incentives and change until we change the rules, then they're going to they're going to be just that. They're going to be exceptions. 
So when in the process of forming a charter school, uh, does the process of shaping access start? Process of shaping access starts at the earliest stages of forming a charter school. So for example, early decisions about the mission of a school, its description, design, these decisions can serve to shape enrollment long before the school has even opened its doors. Um, there are a set of incentives that typically surround a team of people planning and operating charter schools. And so these incentives are to attract students with high test scores who are fluent in English and who don't have expensive special needs um, and sometimes whose behaviors align with school philosophy. So if your success as a charter school depends on enrolling students who are lower cost and who are higher achieving, then you're going to make decisions that favor some students over others at every possible stage. So the earliest stages um, to the latest stages. And in the book, we organize the access restricting, restricting practices in kind of the chronological order in which a parent would encounter them. So first, all the decisions made about a charter school that can shape access before a family decides to enroll. So these are the very early kind of um, decisions. And then the time after a family decides they are interested in applying to a school up until the child is enrolled in that school, we call that the during enrollment phase. And then finally, all the issues that arise after the school year begins post enrollment. So how do factors like location or marketing and advertising uh, shape enrollments and access? Yeah, so going back to that enrollment cycle, location and marketing fall into this pre-enrollment phase. Um, so we're talking about the ways that charter schools have the ability to shape their potential pool of applicants at this point. I think the main point about marketing and advertising is that marketing is not simply a way to kind of broadcast a school and the opportunities there. Marketing is used to narrow cast, right, to shape a school's enrollment by reaching and appealing to preferred students and also kind of discouraging undesirable um, students and families. And importantly, I think closely related to marketing and advertising is the description design of the school, right? So in a competitive market, charter schools survive, they have to, they survive by distinguishing themselves from other schools. And those early decisions I mentioned about the mission of a school can really do that shaping along with then the marketing and advertising. An example of this, you know, um, many charter schools, uh, such as the basis network of schools in Arizona, that are, you know, designed to portray themselves as elite college preparatory schools that are focused on rigorous academics. These schools, you know, put a lot into their marketing and advertising. They really present themselves that way. And they tend to enroll in more affluent and more white student body. Um, because, you know, students and parents who are not highly confident academic, I mean, there's a lot of reasons that they are, they understand through that, the marketing practices and so forth, that these schools are not designed for them. Um, and I think you also asked about location. And so, you know, while location decisions cannot be helped, all brick and mortar schools must locate somewhere, um, but they can be very strategic. And so we're talking about schools that locate in suburbs. You know, for example, there's a Bullish Charter School, which is a suburban school located in Los Altos. It, it has in, so it's located in a uh, kind of wealthier suburb. It also has a hierarchy of enrollment preferences that include reserving half of all open seats for students residing in the wealthiest parts of the school district, right? So it's um, kind of located in a wealthier suburb and then has enrollment preferences for um, the area around it. And and finally, I'll say that, you know, location, you can't separate issues of location with um, from issues of transportation and transportation related barriers to access are widespread. So I think right now only 15 states of charter school laws even specify who, if anyone, must provide transportation for charter school students. So so what if after the process of design and, and the location has been picked um, and the marketing has been sent out, a charter school is flooded with applicants, a, a diverse applicant pool? Uh, that the school uh, perhaps hadn't targeted? Um, what sort of strategies do charter leaders use uh, to try to exclude those students after the fact? Yeah, so you're you're now talking about the, the during enrollment phase. And so again, these are the obstacles that arise between the point a family decides they're interested in applying to a school up until their child is enrolled, right? So kind of after the application stage. 
So keeping in mind that the bottom line um, is that success for you and I'm, you as in a charter school depends on enrolling students who are lower cost and who are higher achieving. During the enrollment process, you can make a number of decisions that will again favor more desirable students over others. So you can implement kind of application related obstacles such as you know mandatory in-person visits. And during a visit, you can have a conversation with the family and steer, you know, steer them away. So these initial discussions between parents and um, charter school folks are really have real, real implications for access. You can also place conditions on enrollment. So you can, um, there, you know, there's a number of ways that conditions based on enrollment can directly or indirectly discourage families. Uh, Additionally, you can lack services. So when a charter school lacks services, if you don't provide free and reduced price lunch, you're shaping student population. I mentioned BASIS earlier. So BASIS does not participate in a subsidized lunch program, uh, even though they're located in districts where a large, large percentage of students qualify for free or reduced price lunch. And so, you know, students who struggle with food security are not going to opt into BASIS for that reason. And then finally, you can require parents to volunteer, right? That's kind of an oxymoron, but mandatory volunteering policies that express, expressly or implicitly require parents to commit a certain number of hours of work as a condition of enrollment, turn families away during this stage. This is a relatively common practice. There's in, Colo in Littleton, Colorado, a school, um, a charter school called Collegiate Academy, and all families are required to volunteer 40 hours uh, per year of work. They can't volunteer. They can pay their way out at a rate of $10 per hour, which comes to $400, which is, again, un unreasonable. So these are the types of obstacles that discourage and turn families away, you know, who lack the time and resources after kind of at the stage that you, you talked about after the application before enrollment. And I think it's important if you think about those, all, all the things we've talked about, and particularly the things in the during stage that, um, that Wajma just mentioned, you can see how within any given community, so let's say the school is located um, in an urban area um, of Los Angeles, and, um, or let's take Chicago. So in Chicago um, and in an area of Chicago that can draw students from um, several different neighborhoods. What Wajma's describing would would help us to understand how even though that charter school is going to going to largely uh, enroll students of color most likely and and actually largely enroll students given the location uh, students who are eligible for free and reduced price lunch it's going to tilt at every stage it's going to tilt toward the more advantaged students in the in the area that could be drawn upon right so it's it's creaming within any given sub, uh, within any given geographic area. And so when we see charter schools point to, well, look at our demographics, we're serving students of color, we're serving a lot of students who are um, students um, eligible for free and reduced price lunch. Uh, so we are representing, or we, we, are, we are serving a, a marginalized community and we are representative of the community that, where we're located. To some extent, that's true, but only only when you don't d dig down a little bit deeper. Um, we oftentimes see when we dig down a little bit deeper that the students that are, that are with special needs who are served are those without moderate or severe special needs. And we see within the um, free and reduced price lunch numbers that there uh, are more students in the reduced price lunch than in the free price lunch. In other words, students who are not so severely in poverty. Um, it's, it's really important to understand those nuances that arise because of the access-related issues we're talking about. So this is a little bit different than access before the fact. There's always this problem of asymmetric information, right, where a charter school is saying, yes, we want to cream those students off of the top, and but there's the potential that they admit students that then they want to exclude um, once they've already been enrolled. So were there any examples or practices that you found of, school, of charter schools that were... Uh, designing practices um, after enrollment where uh, students were being excluded or pushed out of the charter school and using that as another way to shape the kinds of students that they serve? 
you know, access during this post-enrollment period raises two key issues. So like you said, are, are some students who began the year at the school still there? Or are they discouraged from remaining? And then secondly, when, when seats open up during the school year, are students who are not enrolled able to access the school if they wish to? So if a student moves into the neighborhood in, in you know, December, can they enroll in the school, right? And so um, there are a lot of ways that access is shaped after enrollment, right? So there are, uh, one example is kind of grade retention policies, you know, having minimum GPA requirements, um, all these kind of academic, you know, this, this category of academic rigor that charter schools use to push students out, right? Or, or and then at the same time, misleading the inflate test scores. Um, I think the biggest one is discipline, right? We know kind of the well-known harsh disciplinary regimes embraced by what we call no excuses, charter schools. These have obvious access related implications. Um, a lot of times parents just get tired of being called to school multiple times a day, multiple times a week, right? For behaviors that are not inappropriate or bad in any kind of other setting, right? Like fidgeting, for example. And then, you know, a lot of charter schools refuse to backfill or take in transfer students during the school year. Many have certain grade levels, right? So if you don't enter in the ninth grade, you you have no access after the fact. Um, and so these are all, there, there are a number of practices that, fill, that fit into after a student is enrolled in the school. And again, I think that the, the way it happens is, again, there is a targeted discussion right? There's a um, nudging certain students and their families to consider different options, saying that the school is not the best fit for them and so forth. And uh, recalling the kind of high profile example of Success Academy's got to go list from a few years ago. Um, so certainly, yeah, after enrollment, access issues still remain. Yeah, I think, I think what Wajma is covering there is really important. Um, and I want to also stress that uh, Public schools that are district run, not not charter schools, um, have a lot of the same policies and might superficially look the same, right? So um, they're not necessarily good policies, but they do exist. So the you know, uh, it, it, a grade retention policy on steroids or a suspension policy on steroids, where the um, where these these approaches are overused and are harmful for students, and and those policies and those approaches should be criticized, you know, in, with, no matter which school they're in. What makes the charter school context different is that it's combined with the counseling out. It's combined with the option to leave that's always there in the in the background. So, if if my child is suspended from the neighborhood public school, that's certainly harmful for the child and, and, and maybe not even uh, justified. If my child is suspended from, and suspended repeatedly from the charter school, it's, it, it could, could be very well understood and we argue should be understood as an attempt to push the child out of the school and back into the neighborhood public school or back into a different school option. So when, when these practices are used in the school choice context, particularly in the, in the charter school context, they have this additional layer of meaning this, that we need to understand that is shaping who is enrolled in charter schools and who isn't enrolled in charter schools. Yeah, it's really interesting. So it sounds like there's not any one particular practice that uh, drives uh, the majority of access issues. It's like a death by a thousand cuts. It's all of these little things that are making parents either not want to enroll their student or pull them out once they've already applied or pull the student out once they're already in the school um, that is that is creating the access issues. Uh, so let me ask you, um, either in the book or in the months since you've published the book, uh, have you learned about any especially egregious examples of the practices charter school operators will use to shape access? Yeah, so there's a, um, a school here in Colorado, a charter school that's um, been around for about a quarter century in a place called Monument, Colorado. It's called Monument Academy, uh, right next to, near Colorado Springs, right next to the Air Force Academy. Um, about a month ago, the school board, uh, a month, about a month ago before this recording, I'm not sure when this will be broadcast, uh, the school board adopted a 
um, a proclamation, they called it, that is uh, virulently anti-trans students. It's basically telling trans students to stay the hell away uh, from the school. Uh, if, they, if you come, you're not welcome. Um, although I think they have something they're saying, we welcome all students. Um, and they also passed about around the same time, they passed one of these anti-CRT resolutions. So if you take a closer look at this school, um, and this was, this was adopted by the charter board, right? So it's similar to a school board, but it's the board that um, governs the, the charter school. The school, when you take a closer look, the school has a variety of other policies that would uh, discourage or encourage certain students, um, mainly discourage. So that there's a, um, and these are all things, I think it's worth noting, these are all examples of things that we found in other schools as well. So, so the, the school has something that we, see, that we saw in other schools. It has a requirement in the application process that the applicant submit a copy of the student's birth certificate, um, which has implications for students who, who are in the country without documentation. Um, the school also has a, um, a paid preschool associated with it. So it's not officially part of the charter school, but um, it, it effectively is, it's just a, um, a private school attached to it, a private preschool attached to it. And then the school has um, a policy that says, hey, you wanna get waiting list priority, be one of our current students. Um, so that gives, a, this is something again, we've seen elsewhere, it gives a, a family an in to shortcut the waiting list if they can afford to pay for preschool at the school. There are also, it, uh, statements about how when the when the school might deny an enrollment request, so it might deny an enrollment, enrollment request. They say if we decide that the student doesn't meet a required level of um, in the in the student's prior academic record, meet a um, required level of attendance or, per, or performance or credits, and also if sometime in the in the preceding year the student has been suspended from school, they could deny the enrollment. There's also uh, something in the admissions policy about um, requiring the students to take a placement test. So they might require the student to take a placement test, which would determine, among other things, whether or not the student is going to be held back in grade. And then at the end of that section, and I'll quote, it says, as a school of choice, Monument Academy parents, guardians, uh, always may choose to enroll their student in another school. In other words, we're gonna, we might decide to hold your student back but just, just remember, you can choose to go somewhere else. So Monument is a good example. Monument Academy is a good example of some things that we have come across consistently in our research um, and also in our, in our new context in this country, um, some additional hostility with regards to the uh, anti-CRT resolution, in particular the anti-trans resolution. So obviously all of those things are horrible, um, but it seems like going forward, school choice is going to play some part um, in educational policy in the United States. So, so if it's here to stay and, and if you expect it to grow, uh, what recommendations would you make to policymakers about how this system of school choice might be improved to offer equitable opportunities to all kids? The charter school mechanism that's created by any given state's law, we think should be approached as a policy tool. In other words, a way for the state's for the state to accomplish its broader educational policy goal, rather than seeing expanded school choice as an end in itself, as either an end in itself or just the magic of the free market, right? So understand that it's a tool, understand that it's something that can be used and tweaked and used in different ways, but always keep in mind what the, what the ultimate policy goal is. And, and to see why that's important, think about yourself or or anyone you know who is a parent and think about their educational level, their ability to work the system, their access to transportation, um, their knowledge of what options might be available for schools. And then think about the schools you know, either personally or through the media or word of mouth. And we speak about the first, the first category as the demand side, the parents and how they behave as consumers. And the second is the uh, su supply, supply side, excuse me, the, the different schooling options that are available on the supply side. And as you thought about both, both of these, you undoubtedly notice there's, there's, a, there's a continuum or a stratification. Some, some parents have 
much more capacity and likelihood to work successfully within the system um, to gain access to advantages for their children. And some schools appear to be of much higher quality than others. So when we put those two together, we can all predict which parents are going to be successful in gaining access to which schools. And that's the core dilemma of school choice, not just charter schools. Um, there are, I think, good things about markets and market pressures, but there are also very real problems. And this is the central problem, that as a rule, the school choice market will allocate the worst learning opportunities to those children who need the best learning opportunities. So we could change the rules to mitigate some of these harms if we're willing to regulate the charter school system a bit more. The core problem that I just described is always going to be there. And the only way to really confront the poor get poorer problem of stratification is to address the stratification itself, right? Why don't we invest more in schools and their communities um, that we all agree no, need more resources and support? Yeah, I would, I would add that, you know, of course, school choice is here to stay. Of course, charter schools are here to stay. And, you know, the sector is growing. And so it's important to, you know, to, to understand that our, our goal, the goal of all public schools, right, district run public schools, charter schools should be equity and access. And I think that there are some in the charter sector who are really trying to, to kind of embody those goals. I think that, um, you know, it's policymakers can, there are examples of, of CMOs of charter schools who are doing, who are doing, um, who are doing the right thing, who are trying to, to make sure they're attending to issues of equity and access, right? There, um, so there are, there are examples of how charter schools can increase, increase equity. We, we, we bring those up throughout the book, right? I think that the issue is um, the work of good actors kind of pushing back within an unfair system is not a substitute to what Kevin was just talking about, right? That it's a larger kind of systemic issue. The, the, the way incentives are set up now, you know, schools are incentivized into this behavior. And unless those incentives are changed, um, we can't depend on kind of good, good actors, right? We say that they're swimming against the tide. And so I think that that's the, the, what I would add that, you know, sustainably good, you know, good public policy shouldn't incentivize bad behavior. And right now, um, bad behavior is being incentivized. And so we need to, that's, that's, that's where we need to um, work and think. Thank you again, Wajma and Kevin for being on this month's podcast. As always, we hope that you're safe and healthy and remember that for the latest analysis of education policy, you should subscribe to the NEPC newsletter at nepc.colorado.edu and follow NEPC on Twitter at NEPC Tweet.